I'm audible or not? You are audible, audible. Good afternoon, Kavita. Only you and host are here now. Means okay. we are no, a bit early. Just one, once check the, that your slide is coming or not. Yeah, let me do that. Um, so shall I do share screen? Shall I do share screen? Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, I'll just uh, share the screen. So oh, your voice is not very clear. Uh, screen is visible. The screen is perfect. Okay. Uh, but sound is a bit low. Means if low. if you have something like mouthpiece, means bring it closer. Uh, okay. Let me try. Is this better? Yeah, but it's noisy. Noisy. Yeah, this speaker on my laptop doesn't seem to work. Let me try. I just this is not fine. Is this okay? Yes, yes. Fine. Okay, I try speaking louder. So I'll stop my video now. Uh -huh. sure.
welcome everyone and but we still have my according to my computer clock three four minutes and some people are still joining so let's uh, wait a few more minutes before we formally start the program yes. so maybe we we'll wait for three four more minutes so that some more people join Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Professor Kumar. Good afternoon. As some more people are joining, so in two minutes we will start. Yes, yes. <coughs> Hello, Anil. Hi, Kavita. Look forward to your lecture. I'm a cold. <laughs> oh. In the middle of the summer. Uh, did you get it checked up? I hope it's not COVID. No, 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 no. Just a running nose. Okay. But you look nice and cheerful. Okay. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but in, in, in Delhi, you cannot think of a sweater now. Eh? <laughs> in Delhi, when you cannot even dream of a sweater now. No, 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 it, 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 two days ago, it became quite cold here. And I yeah, think when, the fan was on and the window was open and I caught a cold. Yeah, well, this is possible in Bangalore. Yes. Delhi is extremely hot. Yeah. <laughs> Bangalore is at 3,000 feet high. It's always good. It's good play. Good weather. Good weather. <laughs> I mean, today it's warmer. I'm trying it there. So, how many people? 13 people have come. So it's time to start. And before we start the program, I, I would like to say a few words about genesis of this program and National Academy of Sciences India. So the National Academy of Sciences India, or in short, NASI, is the oldest science academy among the three science academies there functioning at the moment in India, including Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, INSA. And NASI was initially established by Professor Meghnath Shaha and colleagues. And till then, it was always interested in social responsibilities. And in the eve of 75 years of independence, all the academies received some letters from government that, uh, and through DST, that one has to do something, some specific program focused on 75 years of independence, focusing on the social development using the science. And so at Delhi chapter, we discussed this and we found that a good way to go for it, to encourage more women to do science and thus to contribute to society. And with keeping this in mind, we submitted a proposal that uh, we'll, we want to organize a series of lecture on where 
only the motto is to encourage young phd students master degree students uh, that especially all the female students to encourage them that they can also do top level science and the best way to do that is to invite the top level scientists to deliver lecture and encourage them give them live examples that if i can do you can also do it and to give a window to students to if they have some doubts to ask that and since this student set is a bit varied so sometime we are having lectures in biology we plan something on chemistry which does not happen and today's lecture is in the interface means which has everything means which has a flavor of chemistry flavor of biology and of course flavor of our very own quantum computing so that's the background and in the series we are organizing this is the fourth lecture uh, the first one was given by professor monju sharma who was former secretary of dbt and chair president of nasi then the next one was given by shohini ghosh who is again a familiar name in quantum information community and third one was given by professor enakshi sharma who was in electronics department in delhi university this is the fourth one and next one will be given by professor chandri masha who is at present uh, president of insa and that's planned on 26th of may but before so this is more or less the background of the series of lecture and we are expected to co continue this throughout the year and roughly one lecture per month uh, and without taking much of your time because many of you have heard this lectures earlier also so we'll move to the introduction of the speaker and i'll request my colleague professor papia choudhury to introduce today's speaker thank you professor patak and uh, welcome you all without delaying let me introduce professor uh, dorai uh, dr kavita dorai currently is professor in the department of physical sciences indian institute of science education and research mohali punjab dr dorai is an nmr spectroscopist whose research is poised at the interface of physics biology she is also deeply involved in the research area of nmr quantum computing metabolomics and methodology development dr durai originally is from raurkela completed her bsc degree from osmania university hyderabad and msc from indian institute of technology kanpur she has completed her phd from indian institute of science bangalore in 1999 under professor anil kumar who is also present here who is known as the father figure of the nmr in india uh she was awarded uh, the martin foster gold medal for the best phd thesis and i have to mention here that she is the first who has done the first experiment in quantum computing prior to join iii scr mohali she was uh, also scientifically attached with the university of frankfurt university of dortmund and carnegie mellon university usa as a research associate till 2004 and then she was attached with indian institute of science madras as assistant professor till 2007 and then he jo she joined isr mohali in 2007 she was honored with indo us research fellowship uh in 2008 and she is the recipient of professor a subramaniam 60th birthday lecture award of the national magnetic resonance society of india in 2013 her current research interests includes nmr quantum computing diffusion studies using gradient nmr nmr of nanomaterials nmr methodology development and biomolecular structure and dynamics determination today her talk will be the topic of a top a talk is applications of nmr in physics and biology quantum computing and brain cognitive functions so on behalf of nasi delhi chapter and jp institute of information technology i welcome professor dorai to deliver the fourth lecture in the women in science lecture series welcome professor dorai over to you okay so thank you so much professor patak and thank you so much professor papia for such a very detailed introduction um i will uh, i mean it's a great honor to be invited to deliver this uh, fourth lecture in the women in science uh, series being organized by the delhi chapter or chapter of nasi and uh, i think it's a wonderful wonderful idea and i hope that uh, this series will continue i'll begin uh, sharing my screen now
So is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. So um, welcome everyone. As Professor Papia has already mentioned, uh, my research is in the interface of physics and biology. And my talk today, I've tried to keep it as non-technical as possible so that uh, students from all different fields of science can get a flavor of what it is I do. Uh, before I even begin, uh, the title of my lecture is Applications of NMR in Physics and Biology, Quantum Computing and Brain Cognitive Functions. And I must add a disclaimer that although I work in quantum computing, I do not do research into brain cognitive functions, but I just thought that I would include this um, to encourage, because I think that it's a wonderful area of research and NMR has lots of applications to it. And I thought it would be a good idea to just give uh, students a brief overview of this uh, field. So let's begin by you know, looking at the basics of NMR. NMR, as many of you might know, stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. So the N stands for nuclei. And what are nuclei? Uh, one can think of them, you know, in the classical picture as small magnetic tops, uh, a small magnetic top spinning on its own axis. And these, of course, uh, nuclei are quantum objects, so they have a magnetic moment, which can be described by uh, mu equal to gamma i h cross, uh, h, h cross being the Planck's constant, gamma being the gyromagnetic ratio, which is, a, which is a property of, which is an intrinsic property of the particular type of nucleus being studied, and I being the angular momentum of the spin. Now we come to the B, to the M, which is in NMR, which is the magnetic field. So if I have a collection of these spins, an ensemble, if you wish, of these little magnetic tops spinning on their own axes, and I put them in, a, in an external magnetic field, I've denoted this by a B0, and an arrow in the positive Z direction. So that's the strength of the magnetic field. And what happens to these spinning tops, tops is they, they start processing with a frequency which, which is called the Lama frequency um, after the guy who discovered this. And um, they start processing around the magnetic field, just like in the Earth's gravitational field, a top starts spinning. Um, in, in, in the Earth's uh, gravitational field. So uh, once the magnet is on, the spins start processing. And it turns out that those spins which are oriented along the, uh, the magnetic field, they have lower energy. So in some sense, um, this leads to a net magnetization. Again, I've denoted it here on this slide by this vector along the magnetic external magnetic field and denoted it its magnitude by m0 so there's a slight spin excess or excess of spins oriented along the magnetic field and one can decompose these individual uh, mu vectors in the in the along z and in the transverse xy plane and then we find out that the the net Magnetic magnetization in the transverse field averages out to zero, and what we're left with is a magnetization along the uh, magnetic external magnetic field. Now we come to the R in NMR. So we've talked about nuclear, which is nuclei spinning um, with a with a magnetic moment, with an intrinsic magnetic moment. M standing for magnetic, where they all start processing in tandem when placed in an external magnetic field. And now R is the phenomenon of resonance. So what happens is that when these spins are spinning in, in the magnetic field at that Lama frequency, uh, one can add an excitation along the, so that is that in this vector picture I've denoted by B1. So remember we had the external magnetic field B0, then we had the net magnetization M0 along the B0 direction, along the positive Z direction. Now I apply an RF, uh, another RF field, which is oscillating. And it has this, it has a magnitude of B1. And it's, it is uh, applied, it's at the same resonance frequency as the spins. So it is applied with a, with a resonance frequency 
of omega zero, the Lama frequency of the spins. And this leads to the phenomenon of resonance. Now from 12th standard physics, all of you are aware what happens at resonance. So you all know this old story of the soldiers who are asked not to march in step when they march across a bridge because the natural oscillations of the bridge might match the oscillations of the frequency of oscillation of their marching steps. And that could lead to a resonant transfer of energy and increase the amplitude of swing um, the frequency um, the, uh, of, of the uh, in, in, increase the amplitude of uh, oscillations of the bridge and it could lead to the bridge breaking. So that is a say, that's a phenomenon of resonance and that's what's happening here. So when an external magnetic field B1 is applied along the XY plane, these spins which are, you know, with this net magnetization, these spins which are oriented along the Z direction, they can absorb energy and it's at resonance, so they, they are able to absorb the entire energy. And the magnetization gets tipped into the XY plane. So it was at equilibrium, it was at Z. I apply this oscillating magnetic field at the Lama frequency at resonance. There's a resonant energy transfer, and the magnetization is tipped to the XY plane. Of course, things start, um, you know, everything wants to relax back to equilibrium. And that's what I've denoted here that when the, the processing XY, MXY magnetization starts to go back to the Z direction, starts to go back to its equilibrium value of M0, then these spins, uh, you know, they, they, they want, in order to, to get back to equilibrium, they have to give off that excess energy which they'd absorb. And that is what is picked up by a receiver coil which is denoted by this coil over here. And that leads to, so this oscillation, oscillatory field, which is getting back to its equilibrium value, it generates this fluctuating magnetic field, generates a current in a coil, which is picked up and amplified. And that is the NMR signal. So now I've told you what N, M, and R stands for. This is a block diagram. This is a very old block diagram uh, of an NMR spectrometer. And here uh, the field is in this direction. But uh, usually the, the, in these days, we have superconducting magnets and the field is applied in the positive Z direction. Um, so what one has here is a frequency generator, which creates that frequency. This is typically RF uh, frequency, so typically in tens of megahertz, which induces the oscillating RF, which is absorbed by the resonant, uh, resonant spins and then emitted, detected, and then recorded as an NMR signal. Quantum mechanically, of course, uh, for those students who are familiar with quantum mechanics, one would say that for a spin with, um, with a quantum number half, um, there are two distinct energy states when placed in a magnetic field. And the splitting between the energy levels is proportional to gamma, which I told you was a constant, which is intrinsic to that particular type of nucleus, and B0, the external magnetic field. So the larger the magnetic field, the greater is the splitting between these two energy levels. And as I had mentioned before, for a B0, for a magnetic field in Tesla, the frequency, um, the resonant frequency is in the RF range. So tens to hundreds of megahertz. Now, we also have another effect in NMR. So if if we had just the Lama frequency and all the spins of a particular type, say all the protons, uh, in a molecule resonated at the same Lama frequency, then I would just have one peak at, at that particular Lama frequency. And that would not be very interesting in terms of finding information about the system, about the molecule. Luckily, what happens is that in each kind of nucleus is also surrounded by a different type of electronic environment. So consider, say, a benzene molecule with uh, one or two of the protons being substituted by a fluorine or a, or a nitrogen. So this makes the two or three of the protons inequivalent magnetically to the others. And that leads to, so they have a different surrounding electron cloud. They have a different electronic environment. And that leads them to see a different magnetic field at uh, so, the, so we of course have the external magnetic field B0 along the Z direction. And now we have this additional field, which is generated by the surrounding electron cloud. 
for, for that particular nucleus. And this either shields, so this particular nucleus, depending on the density of the electron cloud, either sees less of the magnetic field, um, uh, by, with, uh, so it sees a little bit, so it's either shielded or de-shielded from the magnetic field, the B0 field, and this leads to an effective field, B effective. So since different magnetic fields, uh, since the Lama frequency depends on the magnetic field, you have different effective fields and that leads to different Lama frequencies. So one has different peaks in the spectrum. And this, because it's chemical, it's due to the chemical environment, this is called a chemical shift. Shift because there's a shift in the resonance frequency. There's also another effect, um, which, you know, if, if we have, uh, say we wanted to image water in soft tissue, water in, in, a in the human brain, now, all of these water protons, they resonate at the same frequency. And here there is no different chemical environment. So one would think, one would think that, you know, we would, there would be no way to distinguish um, water, which is in different parts of the brain. So the trick is to differentiate these different water protons spatially. And one does that by applying a linearly varying, that's what I've, I've shown here, a linearly varying gradient to that constant magnetic field. And that encodes kind of spatial information so that this omega resonance that we, that we had talked about, the frequency, that begins to vary linearly along with the gradient. And one can then, you know, th that, that frequency distribution can then be turned, converted into an image. And we'll come to that at the slightly, at the later part of this talk. Now, um, now we know that, you know, how to obtain a signal in NMRs. And we also know that due to the chemical shift, one can have literally hundreds of, or maybe even thousands of frequencies, depending on the different electronic uh, or chemical environments of these nuclei. And earlier on, so when in the older days of NMR, people perform what is called CW or continuous wave NMR, which means that depending on the Lama frequency, the resonant frequency of a particular nucleus, they would have to step through individually all the frequencies and then obtain the spectrum, which is a very time consuming and tedious process. Then um, one of the pioneers of NMR, Professor Richard Ernst, came up with the idea of Fourier transform or FT NMR. And what is Fourier transform? It's just a mathematical technique which enables the transformation of information in two different domains. So in this case, we're talking about the time and the frequency domains. So if one has the, the signal in time, which is this you know, energy which we have pumped in, in terms of an oscillating magnetic field uh, into the system, and the frequency domain is the spectrum. So it's, it is uh, the intensity of the NMR peaks which are present in frequency spaces. So it's a function of frequency. So we have the time domain and we have the frequency domain. And how do we, how are we able to, you know, transform from information from the time domain to the frequency domain? We could do that using a Fourier transform. So I have, I have shown you here a little varying um, field which, is, which has an envelope of a square or a rectangle. And when I Fourier transform that, that leads to excitation of infrequency space of all the spins. Now, as a, as a layman analogy, think of having, think of each spin as being the one key of a piano. So I have, you know, lots and lots, maybe I have a piano with a hundred keys corresponding to the hundred different frequencies. Uh, we are talking about res uh, of, uh, radio frequencies, of course, not the audio uh, signal, but you know, just, just, just bear with me with this analogy. So if I want to record the spectrum, I would press the key corresponding to one particular nucleus and then you know, hear it resonate and, and record that NMR signal, and that would be one peak. And then I would step through the piano. But imagine that in, in, to save time, Say I pressed, you know, I had a long wide hand and I pressed all the keys, all the keys of the piano all at once. And then mathematically, I applied a Fourier transform. I would be able to pull out all the frequency information from this jangle of signals that I have in my audio time domain signal. So that's what is 
that gives NMR, modern NMR or Fourier transform NMR its power, that we're able to get information about all the so what i have here is called an fid it's a free free because you know there are no more pulses a pulse has been applied and the signal has been you know the spins have have resonated they've absorbed that energy they've given it back so now they're free to resonate i because it's induction standing for induction it's an induced signal and decay because you know all all uh, good things come to an end so the spins have to relax back to equilibrium so if there was no relaxation, then I'd have this signal continuing forever in time, but that doesn't happen. So after some time corresponding to the relaxation time of the, of the spins, these spins or these free induction decays. So, so a free induction decay is actually an addition of lots of time domain signals corresponding to different, maybe the hundred or thousand, thousands of spins that we have, all resonating at their characteristic llama frequency. And when I apply a Fourier transform to this free induction decay, this is what I get. And this is the NMR spectrum. So the Fourier transform of the free induction decay, the time domain NMR signal gives me the NMR spectrum in, in frequency space. And this is one dimensional Fourier transform NMR, which is very, very complex. It has many, many overlapping peaks. Now there are various methods to complicated schemes to get over to unravel information from this one dimensional NMR spectrum, which I will not go into, but you know, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the basics of NMR. Now we come to the applications. The applications of NMR are actually, you know, too many to, to uh, list over here, but I'll just talk about a few. So in chemistry, of course, it is very much used by chemists to find out what is the molecule that, you know, uh, the structure of the molecule that uh, a chemist has uh, synthesized in the lab. Uh, it's also very, NMR is also very well used in drug design and by pharma companies, because as you can see down here, I have uh, denoted here, this is a protein, but one can think of it as a substrate to which various drugs, I've, I've, these are these small molecules, different kinds of drugs, they have different shapes. And they have to go and bind to the pocket of this, the binding pocket, they have to go and dock to this particular uh, protein or substrate in order for the drug action to happen. Now, a, a pharma company doesn't, you know, they synthesize maybe dozens of, of uh, possible drugs in a, in a day. And how do they know which one is the correct drug? They would know that by the shape. So it's like a lock and a key. So there's a lock, which is this uh, um, particular substrate. And the, the each of these drugs is of a particular shape. So the key has to go and fit the correct key with the correct of the correct shape will actually go and dock and bind. And that is the correct drug. So NMR can be used to you know uh, very quickly find out which drug which synthesized molecule is actually a good candidate for a drug. Of course, NMR has also been used in geophysics. Uh, people have used, this is a portable NMR spectrometer and they've been, it, they've actually, you know, transported it to the Antarctic and they've uh, tried to find out brine, which is seawater pockets, which are present in Antarctic sea ice. Um, they, they can also be uh, used NMR, uh, these portable NMR spectrometers can also be used to look for petroleum uh, deposits. Um, one can use, uh, environmental scientists can use NMR, have been using NMR to say, profile the groundwater table in a particular region, find out information about the pollut pollutants which are present in the groundwater, what is their nature and so on. A material science scientists of course use NMR extensively. Um, so this, this I've shown is, a snapshot of the water which is flowing in a carbon nanotube. And uh, there's, there's a water peak, they've been able to distinguish between an external water and an internal water. So water which is kind of trapped inside of the carbon nanotube. Uh, NMR is now very much used in food technology. So if, uh, if there's a company which produces wine, uh, a vineyard which produces wine, they can use NMR to find out if the expensive wine which they've which they've been storing for so long, has it turned into vinegar or is, is it actually good champagne? Uh, NMR in physics, of course, there are lots and lots and lots of applications. Some of them are 
you know, uh, what is the rheology of a complex fluid? A complex fluid follows non-Newtonian dynamics. NMR has been very much used uh, in biomedical imaging. So you must all, all have heard of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and that is works on the same principle as NMR. It's just that uh, people were scared of the word nuclear, so they didn't want to use uh, nuclear in, the, in, in conjunction with um, this medical technique. And it's a completely non-invasive technique and can be used to find out, so it can be used to image soft tissue. So here uh, it has been used to identify if there's a brain tumor or if a person has you know, arthritis or a knee, pro a knee problem. So what about the cartilage in the knee? Is it uh, still there? Has it been degraded and so on? Then I will later on in the talk, uh, talk about this particular application, which is functional MRI. I call it images from inner space, not outer space, because it's from, it's an image of the brain and this particular study was done on taxi drivers to see how to you know find out how do they where do they store memory and how do they map the fastest route to a place nmr of course in, is extensively used in biology in both getting to the structure of a protein getting information about metabolites in my biofluids and taking snapshots of a protein folding pathway the NMR Nobel journey has been really extensive. So it began with Zeeman in 1902 and Stern, Rabbi for discovering various uh, aspects of uh, the NMR phenomenon. Then Bloch, uh, Felix Bloch and Edward Purcell won the physics Nobel in 1952 uh, for the first observation of an NMR signal. Then Professor Ernst, whom I mentioned earlier, won the chemistry Nobel in 1991 for developing high resolution NMR methodology. Professor Butrich um, won the chemistry Nobel in 2002 for biomolecular structures or three dimensional structures of proteins. And finally, Mansfield and Lauterberg won the medicine Nobel for MRI in 2003. What is NMR going to look like? So I've given you an a brief, a bird's eye view of the various kinds of applications. What, is, uh, what does it hold in the future for NMR? Well, one uh, idea which people in Japan are working on is miniaturizing NMR uh, so that it, the spectrometer, which is pretty huge at the moment, is uh, smaller and smaller. And of course, uh, I haven't talked about how you know intense um, or how weak is the NMR signal. It's a very insensitive, very weak signal. And people are now working on dif different detection techniques. So adding say um, optically detected NMR um, so that one gets a better NMR signal. Now I move on to the first part of the uh, research that I've, I've been working on. And that is the applications of NMR to quantum computing. So let's take a step back and see, you know, what is a quantum computer? A quantum computer is a device which uses the laws of quantum mechanics to perform or to compute uh, the same things that a classical computer does. And like you know that classical computer works on classical bits, which work on binary logic. So a computer which performs anything, any operation, uh, just, you know, the machine language consists finally of a string of zeros and ones. That's the binary logic. Now I can think of using a quantum device, which uses the laws of quantum mechanics and uh, works on quantum binary logic. So wh what one has here, instead of bits, one thinks of quantum bits or qubits. And just one, just as one has zero or one, these are quantum systems. So I can have the zero a logical uh, an eigenstate of uh, the of this of this system. Say I have a spin half nucleus, and we know that it can be oriented either along the magnetic field or uh, against the magnetic field. So there are two states to this system, two eigenstates, and I can represent them as logical zero and logical one. Now, this is not the, the full story of a quantum computer or uh, something which has, uh, uh, which has qubits because this quantum system can actually exist not just in zero or one, but in a superposition, in a quantum superposition of this zero and one. So that is you know, one um, way which, is, uh, which gives the quantum computer its power over classical computers, but that's not the only 
one. I'll come to, to the other in a moment. So one can have, you know, if one has a series of, of uh, quantum bits, a series of qubits, uh, one can manipulate various superposition states. Say, so this is one example. I would have all the uh, qubits in a, in a superposition, alpha times all of them in zero plus beta times all of them in the one state. Now, what can a quantum computer do? So good news is it can store lots of numbers simultaneously. So n qubits can store two to the power n numbers. So three qubits can store eight combinations going from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, all the way to 1, 1, 1. The great news is that this leads to super fast computational speeds. So a three qubit quantum computer computes eight times faster than a three bit classical computer. So a 64 bit quantum computer computes two to the power 64 times faster. So this is, this is the power um, of a quantum computer. And this is why every nation is now in the race to build a quantum computer. The bad news, of course, is that you know uh, measurement collapses the, su the superposition that we have. And the really bad news is that decoherence, which is the interaction of the system with its environment, you know, the relaxation that I spoke about previously, when all the spins give off the energy and go back to the equilibrium, that process in the process of information exchange between the system and the environment that kills the result of the computation. So this information that is there, even while the computation is going on, it is very fragile and it is liable to be killed. Um, there's also one more, I talked about quantum superposition, but there's also entanglement, which is believed to be at the heart of this computing speed up, this power of a quantum computer. And uh, what this means, what is entanglement, quantum entanglement? It just is, so I have two parties, Alice and Bob, and uh, let's assume that they share an entangled uh, state. So Alice has a qubit and Bob has a qubit, and these two qubits are in an entangled state. So remember I told you that this qubit can be in the zero or one state, this qubit or spin half particle can be in the zero or one state. Now both of them together, can be in a, in a state, let's say, they're in a state, say, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, with some factor, or 0, 1, plus 1, 0. So one, both of them are up, plus both of them are down, that kind of superposition. That is called an entangled state. And what does this lead to? This says that if they're in an entangled state, the measurement of one qubit is always correlated to the measurement of the other. So even without... Bob measuring his qubit, if Alice measures and she, and she knows what the state of her qubit is, she can just give this information to Bob and he will know because these two qubits are in, in a correlated in an entangled state, he will know what the state of his qubit is. What does a quantum computer actually look like? There are now several technologies, quantum technologies, which are in the fray. There are superconducting qubits. There is NMR, the NMR spectrometer that I've uh, represented here. There are trapped ions, there are photonics, and many, many more technologies. And uh, uh, how do we build an NMR quantum computer? So I had told you that you have spins, which can be spin half particles. I told, already told you about the phenomenon of NMR. And so consider you know, a, a, a molecule which has two carbons and one proton. These are the NMR active nuclei. And so this here is trichloroethylene. And I have the proton in the up state and the two carbons, one is in the down state and the, third, the second carbon is in the up state. So I can represent this eigenstate of the system by a zero, one, and a zero. So I can map all these spin states onto logical zero and logical one and build in some sense a spin quantum register or a register of qubits. Now, in NMR, of course, there are certain problems which have been tackled. So, you know, for a quantum computer, one needs an initial state, which has to be a pure state, which has to be, you know, one has to reset a computer to and put all the spins, say, in one particular state, say, all of them in, in state zero. And that is not possible in NMR because we're talking about ensembles of spins and uh, at equilibrium, they're all in a Boltzmann distribution. So people have found, I'll not get into the technical details, but people have found ways and means of getting uh, around this or circumventing this problem of have, not having pure states um, at thermal equilibrium. 
then of course one would need to implement you know it's not enough to have just a set of qubits which are talking or interacting to each other with each other one also needs a high degree of quantum control and how these uh, quantum gates are implemented is via rf pulses remember i told you that nmr you know the frequencies are in the radio frequency range so rf stands for radio frequency and a certain set of delays delays where you know the spins are evolving under the under the free hamiltonian freely evolving under the spin hamiltonian and then one has to so one uh, one prepares this system the set of qubits nmr qubits in a ground state in a pure state applies various quantum gates implements the desired quantum algorithm and then you know um, constructs reconstructs the result of the computation by making a measurement and that particular technique in nmr i won't go into its details is called density matrix reconstruction so there are many many success stories of nmr quantum computers they've been used to uh, demonstrate the implementation of different kinds of algorithms like the deutschhauser the quantum fourier transform quantum search quantum factoring and so on they've also been used to simulate so as richard feynman said in 1982 the power of a quantum computer could be used to simulate you know the physics of different kinds of quantum systems so in quantum chemistry quantum computers have been used to simulate molecular hydrogen obtain its ground state energy to to simulate spin chains and the um, their physics to simulate quantum chaos implement the quantum baker's map and so on and so forth i'll just um, let me see if i have time to go into this so uh, actually i will not i will continue to go. so what we did in my lab um is we we've been working for a while now with uh, uh, trying to quantify quantum entanglement i told you what quantum entanglement was so as you know you increase the number of qubits this kind of multipartite quantum entanglement becomes very difficult to characterize and to measure and so we found different ways of doing that i will not go into the details of this uh, you know we can come back to this at the end of my talk um so we have also looked at things like you know pinning down quantum contextuality using an nmr quantum computer and just to give you an idea of what is quantum contextuality um this is a property of again like entanglement it's a property contextuality is a property of quantum systems so uh, suppose you have a garage and if you open your garage door in the morning uh, you you expect to see your car but will you find a peacock there and the answer depends on whether your garage is in aiza mohali because we have lots of peacocks and they you know sometimes squeeze through the garage doors or whether your garage is in iceland which does not uh, presumably does not have uh, peacocks i haven't been to iceland so i can't say for sure so the context of when you how you make the measurement that you've made is opening the garage door and the context of that depends on where you are whether you're in iceland or whether you're in aiza mohali so that is quantum contextuality and we've done various experiments uh, you know using quantum contextuality again i will not go into that now i come to the later part of my talk this is not my own research but i just find it very exciting and interesting so i thought i'd share it with you um one of the enduring mysteries of the universe is the human brain so you know there are several questions that one can ask do we learn mathematics the way we learn a foreign language why is it so hard to learn a language the older we get i mean i've known small children they are so multilingual um they speak their mother tongue they speak english hindi kannada punjabi so they they find it very easy to pick up a language but of course you know for adults it's very very difficult and some of us don't uh, learn more than two languages is the memory of a dream is it different from the memory of an actual event and can you distinguish you know 20 years down the line can you distinguish between the memory of a dream a very you know uh, strange and stark dream that you had from the memory of something which actually happened can somebody who has a stroke relearn the things that they have forgotten how do we remember the past and how do we block past traumas these are some of the you know mysteries and questions that um, psychiatrists and neuro cognitive neurologists have been asking and functional mri is one of the ways in which some of these questions can be answered so this is just a picture of the brain and uh, one i'll not talk about using functional mri 
um, to unlock the secrets of the brain. And functional MRI depends on the bold signal, B-O-L-D, standing for uh, blood, not gluc, blood oxygenation level dependent signal, B-O-L-D. And what happens is, so you can see uh, in the picture on the right, this blood vessel is, uh, is more dilated and there's more, you know, these are neurons. And uh, when, when they're resting, there's a certain amount of blood flow. But when they're activated, when these neurons fire, the, the, the blood vessel or th uh, things here, you can see is, is you know, much more well-defined. So when these neurons fire, they want oxygen. So where neuronal activity in the brain is higher, there is more blood flow. And it, the interesting thing is that, you know, blood is, uh, oxygen is uh, delivered using hemoglobin, as you all know. And this has very interesting magnetic properties. It's diamagnetic when oxygenated and paramagnetic when deoxygenated. So if I look at, if I'm able to detect the differences in the magnetic properties of hemoglobin as translated to differences in that magnetic resonance blood signal, that can, you know, help me map certain kinds of information about neuronal activity, which is happening in the brain. And I can get an image of this, this activity of these neurons actually firing in the brain. So this is the functional MRI setup. Um, the, the subject is placed inside this MRI scanner. Some of you might have had an occasion to have an MRI scan. It's quite scary. Um, so you're, you're pushed inside this magnetic field with these huge gradient coils. And uh, here, this, the, in a functional MRI setup, uh, the subject can, you know, see, so he, he or she can get visual clues from a video screen, and a, which is attached to a video projector. Um, he or she can also listen. So using headphones, um, one can listen to various audio cues and clips. And uh, he or she has access to a button, which, you know, depending on what is uh, shown to him or her on the screen, uh, he or she can press the button. And all of this information and his brain scan is, you know, fed back into the computer and recorded and then so that's what I've said here. The subject is placed inside the scanner, given various cues, presses buttons. And while this you know, activity is happening, while the visual cues and the or or oral cues are being given to the subject, they respond by pressing those buttons. And their brain shifts because the brain is now being given the stimuli. The brain shifts between a resting state and an active state. So a series of images are then acquired while this task is being performed. And these images are analyzed using sophisticated digital image processing techniques. So this is one area where they wanted to, one of these fMRI studies looked at memory and, you know, like, like I talked about, whether we store dreams in a different place, memories of dreams in a different place, uh, not, and, and so on. And uh, of course, reaction to pain. So what parts of the brain light up when there is some amount of pain uh, signals being given. Um, this is a face recognition. So you can see there's, you know, a little bit of a light up over here. This is part of the visual cortex. So what was, what happened was the subject was shown photographs of known people known to her and of strangers. And when the known, uh, when she looked at the well, not she just a, a set of subjects. When they looked at uh, a known face, uh, they, they were able to recognize it. And there was increased blood flow in that face recognition part of the visual cortex of the brain. They've also, there have been uh, fMRI studies uh, on, uh, you know, people who have psychological disorders. So this is a normal uh, brain subject. This is a brain of a normal control subject. And uh, this is of a schizophrenic uh, subject. And they were both given the same set of tasks, some kind of memory task. And you can see that, you know, the normal, there are more parts of the brain being activated in a normal subject as compared to a schizophrenic subject. So that's what I said, that some scans, the scans show some areas are more active in the normal control subjects. There have been, you know, very many numerous fMRI studies, too many very, very fascinating ones, too many for me to, you know, tell you over here. But some of the questions that have been explored are, you know, the brain and mathematics. So how do young children learn to process arithmetic? 
then uh, there have been studies which show that you know the left hemisphere gets activated by analytical like problem solving tasks whereas the right hemisphere is for more like memory and automatized processing there have been studies on the brains of mathematics professors and normal people i mean i'm sorry i don't mean to offend uh, any mathematicians in the audience but you know they they special math, math mathematicians are special so they were they were given uh, you know oral clues so uh, they were given different mathematical and non mathematical logical statements uh, and they had about 4 seconds to decide uh, if they were true or false or meaningless and mathematicians mathematicians performed equally well on both the math and the non math and unsurprisingly normal people um, couldn't evaluate the, sorry not non math couldn't evaluate the mathematical statements very well um there've also been studies about music and the brain not just human brains so one study exposed crocodiles to simple re repetitive sounds and complex classical music and they found that you know the very different uh, parts of the brain were activated in response to classical music now please don't ask me how did they get the crocodiles into the scanner um that i i can share the reference and you can read the details so i now come to the end of my talk i still have 10 minutes and as a need professor nirban told me that this is also kind of motivating uh, talk for young women scientists so these are just a, some bits of advice um, you can take it with a pinch of salt and not used to giving advice so first advice of course is you know believe in yourself because uh, if you don't no one else will um don't follow the fashion um uh, for instance when i began and i joined professor anil kumar in iisc bangalore um the fashion then was condensed matter and everybody was rushing to do either particle physics or superconductivity and nmr i was told was you know it was not very fashionable um but i spoke to anil and i found what he was doing fascinating and down the line you know i've really like i really resonate with nmr i love doing research in nmr so you should you know explore on your own and follow your own path and don't be afraid to question connect or interact um somehow because of social conditioning i i speak for myself i'm not very forthcoming in in you know conference talks so if i attend a conference and there's a lecture it's very very difficult for me even now to you know put up my hand and say excuse me i don't know what you what you what you mean by that it's very difficult for me to interrupt or even ask questions stand up in a audience of 200 people most of them men and ask questions so i have learned to you know modify that instead of forcing myself to to ask those questions then and there i write down my questions and i go and you know personally talk to the scientist and most often they are more than willing to explain because they are also very excited about their science they're more than willing to explain what i was not able to understand and sometimes i correspond via email so um it's not you know you don't always have to uh, rush in to ask questions if you don't want to uh, you can try other ways of connecting and interacting with scientists of course you should remain connected with societal issues because science without humanity is just another intellectual tool and my um, you know main advice to the women young women in this audience is if you can't be fire which is fearless and and fierce be stone which is hard and obstinate if you can't be stone be earth which is patient and resilient if you cannot be earth be water which is soft and restless and remember that water always makes its own way and water is the strongest of them all um this is of course my i can't uh, give a talk without uh, acknowledging all my students past and present it's because of them that i'm able to you know talk science to all of you they do the work and i get to talk about it so these are a few of my phd students um my the alumni and postdocs and i also have a currently a master student working with me he's working on artificial neural networks and implementation on nmr quantum computers I would also like to thank all my collaborators and funding partners and especially funding which came through in pandemic times I would I'm really really grateful to DST under the QUST scheme for uh, giving me a large grant to perform NMR quantum computing and the Stars MHRD 
um, or MOE as it's called now, uh, for, an, for a grant for NMR metabolomics, which I didn't talk about um, in this talk, but you know, that it was just too much to pack in. So finally, thank you for your attention. This is a night view of the Aiza Mohali campus, and it's been taken by one of my PhD students, Akshay Gaikwad. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Kavita, for a nice talk covering so many different things, and especially for the last last slide giving means not this slide means the one with the advices for the young students. So it's open for questions, and past I would be happy if the students ask questions and interact. Yes. So anyone means the group is not big here because there are some people in YouTube also. But anyone wants to ask a question, just you don't need to raise hand. Means you you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am, for such a very nice talk. So, as you have said that NMR-based quantum computer has lots of applications. So, I just want to know from your expertise that which application will be more prominent in the coming year, say till 2030. So, okay. So, um, there are a couple of things. Uh, NMR, as it is now, is like I had mentioned, it's an insensitive technique and, you know, it's a, uh, so the, the number of qubits, which NMR qubits that one works with are limited. At the moment, they're about 10, 12, 15 or so. And to build an actual quantum computer, which does, you know, large computational tasks like quantum factoring, one would need a large uh, qubit register. So that is one of the limitations. And I'm not sure there are people who are working, there are groups with, who are working on, you know, overcoming this limitation, uh, which may or may not happen. So I'm not sure if an actual quantum computer will be built using NMR, but, uh, or, or it could be, you know, some kind of hybrid technology. So two, two uh, quantum technologies, NMR and something else which could build a, build a you know, large scale uh, quantum register with uh, 100 or more qubits. But definitely, you know, NMR has a lot of promise in terms of using it as a test bed quantum processor and also to explore foundations of quantum mechanics because there's so many questions in um, quantum mechanics that we still don't understand. And the more we ask, the more we seek, the more, more answers we get. So NMR quantum computers will definitely be used for that. And quantum simulation, that's another um, interesting field. And I think in 2030, um, NMR quantum computers, one of the major uh, research areas would be quantum simulation. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Other questions? Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, thank you for the amazing talk. I'd uh, like it if you could share more light on uh, the bold signals and FM, FMRI that you were talking about yeah. on the magnetic properties of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, um, shall I go back to that slide just a minute? Yeah, so uh, the fact that hemoglobin has these two different states, so it's when when it's um, oxygenated, it's diamagnetic. When it's when it's deoxygenated, when it doesn't have those oxygen molecules, it turns paramagnetic. Now that leads to a difference in its mag that is a difference in its magnetic properties. So when when people look at the NMR, I'm trying to give it, make it as non-technical as possible. So when people try to look at the difference in these two signals, hemoglobin, blood hemoglobin when it is oxygenated and, and hemoglobin when it is deoxygenated, those two signals are, um, are different, okay? And that leads to a different pathway of, so one is able to, um, map which for for an uh, for an NMR spectroscopist or an fMRI uh, person scientist, she is able to look at okay in this part of the brain this neuron is fire this these neurons are firing much more 
Okay, so they, she's able to to capture the signal. It's in a, in a series of of frames. It's not just so every part of the brain is imaged, and those part and and the entire you know image is divided into voxels or volume elements, and then the amount of signal which is present in each voxel is computed and and then compared with the resting state of the brain is, does that answer your question yes ma'am thank you ma'am yeah. yeah i have a small question yes um, yes there's a nice talk and many new things we learned from your talk uh, in one of your slide you have shown that neurons higher i want i want to see the slide on that uh, how you are doing? How, what do you want to mean by neurons? What do I mean by neurons firing? Yeah. So neurons getting activated. So what happens when a signal, you know, when when we're shown something visual, okay, or uh, when we're asked to recognize uh, a photograph, uh, say you have the photograph of the prime minister and you have a photograph of a total stranger, and immediately you look at the prime minister and some something happens in your brain. What happens is that there are certain, the, these neurons, you know, they have synaptic activity. So there's, there's a connection between them and that is called firing. That means neuron is giving signal at activated, that. Yes. Oh. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, please continue. And thank you for such a nice talk. Ma'am, in mm -hmm. one of your slide, you were talking about that Fourier transform in NMR, yes. like going from one domain to another domain. So we know mathematically how Fourier transform can be done, but how can we visualize it physically? Well, physically, how this Fourier transform in a NMR can be done? Uh, physically, oh, see, it's a mathematical technique. So what happens is that when the signal is collected the the resonant signal is collected uh, by the receiver coil and it's amplified and it's stored okay so it, it's done on the computer physically so one one applies a discrete Fourier transform okay. the signal is collected it's digitized and one applies a discrete Fourier transform on it it's actually a fast Fourier transform an FFT algorithm and uh, if you'd like more details I, I just go look for the Wikipedia on fast Fourier transform, FFT. Yeah, probably you have read it when you read source algorithm. Yes. So, any, any other question? Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, you have already mentioned that uh, qubit can maybe produced by animal, but uh, uh, my question is that, uh, is it possible to is it possible to uh, prepare Qtrit using uh, NMR also? Qtrit, yes, definitely. In fact, in our lab, we work with higher dimensional systems quite a lot. Uh, we work with Qtrits, we work with Qquarts, which are uh, four dimensional uh, quantum systems uh, as well. Yeah, I, I, and I think that, you know, that is a, one of the very interesting aspects of a quantum computer that not just everybody's focusing on qubits, of course, as a workhorse of uh, quantum computers. But I think it's very interesting to look at uh, new algorithms, new gates, which would have to be uh, you know, designed and uh, new decoherence suppression strategies, which would have to be designed to look at QDIT systems. So definitely, yeah, thank you for that question. And ma'am, uh, also my question is that, uh, uh, you suppose uh, NMR uh, can produce the QTREAT or the, well, the higher dimensional Mm -hmm. uh, quantum system and uh, how means uh, how much uh, maybe the limitation uh, of the uh, qtreat or qubit uh, for a quantum computer is it a limitation or upper bound something um see it, it's not something which is very not many pe people are working with qubit quantum computing and uh, the it seems like a trade off to me so on the one hand, you have a larger, uh, larger uh, Hilbert uh, space dimension. So that's a definite advantage. So using fewer qubits, you can access a larger Hilbert space. And that would mean that, you know, you can, your, your uh, because after all, we want larger and larger Hilbert space to work with in a quantum computation. So that means that, you know, you can uh, have, have more 
quantum computing computing power in a qubit quantum computer as compared to a qubit quantum computer but um, on the other hand you know that the coherence properties of at least in nmr the coherence properties of qubits uh, are very bad whereas for qubits they are they are much uh, much much better and in terms of gates you know it's much simpler to work with uh, gates on qubits than on qubits but maybe you know in the future hybrid qubit qubit quantum computing would be I, i think there's a lot of theoretical work that needs to be done even before the experiments can go up, get done has that answered your question Uh, yes ma'am uh, thank you and actually just i thought about that uh, suppose a global and algorithm uh, mm -hmm. which uh, which may perform or mm -hmm. just use the qubit uh, to perform the mm -hmm. uh, factorization in the using the quantum mechanics or the quantum mm -hmm. properties so mm -hmm. uh, actually you uh, uh, just i uh, understand that uh, you want to address that the hybrid qubit mm -hmm. is more stable or suppose uh, less decoherence effect yeah i don't know this is just things that i am throwing at you i have not i have not uh, you know literally studied it so this is my gut feeling and i also feel that new algorithms will have to be designed so it's not going to be you know just transporting the grover search uh, which was implemented on designed for qubits uh, onto qubits so to actually harness the power of a qubit quantum computer one would need to the idea is there that they 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 have access to a larger dimensional hilbert space but i think you would need to design you know you have to think out of the box and design um, new al algorithms yes yes okay thank you ma'am okay anything else anyone have else has any any other query so if not let's thank the speaker once again for a very wonderful talk and thank you everyone for participating and getting engaged in the discussion so we hope we'll have more discussion in the meetings and for students who are more focused on quantum information and interested in such thing so you can if you have more queries after because this is in the youtube also the lecture if you have more queries you can drop mail to professor duvari definitely uh, definitely duvari you can directly write her and ask your questions and you will have opportunities to meet in conferences and clarify those things and it's my pleasure to thank you all and especially my thanks to professor anil kumar for making it convenient to join in this talk so thank you everyone and we'll see you once again in the fifth lecture of this series on 26 may thank you thank you thank you everyone